Hello, everybody. This is Jerry Learns Business, and I'll probably put this on Fight Commentary Breakdown too. We have Tom Nardone, special guest today. He is the president of Bullet Safe Bulletproof Vests. Welcome, Tom. Hey, thanks, Jerry. Definitely. So um, tell me about your story. How did you sort of get into your field? <laughs> yeah. Well, I went to engineering school, so I've, uh, I actually have a master's degree in engineer, mechanical engineering. Wow. But I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree, and I went to work for a helicopter company, Sikorsky Aircraft. Igor Sikorsky is the guy who invented the helicopter, and his helicopter company is in Connecticut. So I worked there. I was a test engineer. Test engineers are people that make sure things do what they're supposed to do. So I uh, made sure things did what they were supposed to do. One of the things I made sure uh, did what it was supposed to do was the fuel tank liners are supposed to stop bullets. So I worked on those. And uh, at the time, the fuel tank liners were made out of Kevlar. And the idea was to switch them to a high molecular weight polyethylene. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, we, uh, the company knew that that would save a bunch of money. It would actually save 70% of the cost of the fuel tank liner. But they had to determine if it would stop bullets just as well. So I got to run that test. And it did. It was very effective. Wow. So... The company swapped out the part and saved 70%. So um, it was quite a bit of money. I think the original part was like 200000 and the new part was like 60000 So big deal. And I won like this, you know, like the type of award you put on your desk, like a little piece of paper. And it went on my resume, and I ended up getting a job at Ford Motor Company where I learned how to make things inexpensively. I like cars, so I wanted to work at Ford. So at the time I left Sikorsky Aircraft, a bulletproof vest was a thousand bucks and they were made out of Kevlar. So I, you know, it's just something that went in my memory banks, you know. Years and years later, uh, I was working at Ford and I was in a store that sold bulletproof vests. And I was like, oh, um, how much do these things cost? And they were like, no, oh, they're like a thousand bucks. And I was like, oh, are they Kevlar? And they're like, nah, most of them are made with poly polyethylenes. And I was like, wait a second. If they switch to polyethylenes, how come they aren't 30% of the price, right? Like, what, did, what happened to the discount? Price? Yeah. So, um, so I looked into it, and the reality is the reason they are really expensive is because it's to go to every police chief in America and to send a sales rep to have lunch with them and to measure every cop in America, to measure their belly, measure their chest. It costs a ton of money. So... My company, when I launched this company, Bullet Safe, I realized there was a bunch of people out there that needed bulletproof vests but couldn't afford that level of like service. They just needed a small, medium, large, extra large 2X. They had jobs like repo men and bar secure bouncers and uh, security guards and armored cars uh, and EMTs and stuff like that. So we did some market research. We interviewed 100 armed security guards and asked them what they could pay and they basically the maximum they could pay was 299 bucks so we did what we could and we tried to launch a 299 dollar bulletproof vest and we i think we made a great one it stops bullets really well it's fairly comfortable it's you know no bulletproof vests are really comfortable but it's pretty good yeah. and uh it's really affordable so uh we launched that company and that was seven and a half years ago wow and yeah. i can attest that you know, like you said, no bulletproof vest is completely comfortable, but I've worn this and sat on the couch. So, you know, it, 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 you get used to it. Yeah, you get used to it. I mean, they, they flex to your body. You get used to wearing them. Uh, just like you get used to wearing a sweatshirt or anything like that, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's like the first time someone wears a tie or the first yeah. time someone in our current climate, the first time someone wears a face mask, right? <laughs> but eventually, you almost can't do without it anymore. Right, right. It's definitely a lot like a suit coat. Like you see these guys that work in banking and stuff like that and financial guys and they have to wear a suit to work every day. That's excruciating. If I have to wear a suit, I'm dying in that thing. Yeah. You know, like yeah. if I go to a summer wedding or something, <laughs> yeah. but you know, that's just, your body just acclimates to it. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like you were a star employee when you worked at the helicopter company. And then when you went to Ford, you were a star employee. So um, when along the line did you say, okay, I think I want to be my own boss? Well, was there a moment or was it kind of like a gradual thing? Yeah, I was, um, they say that uh, being an entrepreneur is hereditary sometimes. So both my dad and my mom owned businesses. So uh, my dad owned a liquor store, like a party store my whole life. Um, and growing up in Massachusetts, I, I spent a lot of time working there and, 
you know, dealing with the customers and uh, helping out just anything I could. And he worked really hard and I uh, respected him for that. I, mm -hmm. I, uh, and then um, when I was a teenager, I was the youngest kid. And when I went off to college, my mom bought an ice cream store. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually she and my brother turned that into four ice cream stores. And she was successful with that too. So um, I think it was just a matter of time. I, I had that engineering mind. I liked the product and the development and that sort of stuff. I tried to start a business when I was in college, but they're just really, you can't really, as a young engineer without a lot of experience, it's much harder to start a company. It's better for like older, you know, people with who have a bit of experience and you need yeah. money, you know, engineering businesses usually take a lot of investment. Yeah, exactly. Like this business, Bullet Safe lost money, planned to lose money for the first, you know, two years and we did. And then we finally, you know, got enough customers like to get that price, Jerry, that people could pay, we had to sell them at a loss at first, mm -hmm. knowing that we would get the volume to get the price to get it all to work out. I see. And that's a great segue into kind of like what were some initial challenges. I mean, it sounds like one of the initial challenges is spreading the word, right? Getting people to be like, okay, this is a bulletproof vest and it's cheaper, but doesn't mean it, it loses quality. Uh, what were some other challenges? Yeah, there was a real struggle for legitimacy. You know, when you offer something that's half the price of someone else's product and you say it performs just as well, I mean, that's, you know, there aren't a lot of people that'll believe you. So what we tried to do is we try, and we still do, we try to get our product in the hands of people like yourselves. Mm -hmm. People I don't know, I've never met, here's my vest, shoot it. Find out what you think, you know? Yeah. So we invite, you know, people who have an audience to do that. And uh, that, so that's very helpful. The other thing was to get stores to work with. You know, some people that buy our vest don't have credit cards. They can't really buy online, so you need to get the product in stores. Um, for, we were fortunate there. We got, like, a lot of uh, Army-Navy stores. And those companies have been selling used police vests for years. So they already had the customers coming in to buy a cheap bulletproof vest. But now instead of buying a used out-of-warranty one, they could get a brand-new one with a warranty. So they were really happy. Wow. Wow, that's so interesting. And um, what was the process like approaching those stores? Like, did you hire a bunch of salespeople or was it mostly just you and like your, your closest um, people working with you? Yeah, um, well, I knew from, uh, from, uh, from advisors, you know, friends and stuff that helped me out that if you're going to run a company without like a big sales force, you got to go to like all trade shows. You got to meet the people where they are already. So we just did trade show after trade show and you know, to go, like recently we looked at our map and I rarely go out on the road, maybe like three or four times I would go visit a city, but we didn't have any sales, any stores in San Diego, which is a good corner of the country. And we didn't have any stores in Baltimore, Maryland, which is a high crime area. So I flew to Baltimore and I flew to San Diego just to try to do that type of stuff. And flying out to those cities, you know, you probably put down about three grand into that, you know? and a few work days that I'm not here getting anything done. Um, granted, San Diego is a hell of a place to go, you know, so I was happy to do it. And Baltimore was kind of cool too. But, um, but, it, but for that kind of money, I could go to a trade show someplace or maybe for about six grand, I could go to a trade show and get a very small booth and meet many more retailers. So that's what we still do to this day, trade shows. I see. So it sounds like it's just being very strategic about where you can get to a place where there's a high number of people that you yeah. want to reach. You have to really be a cheapskate about it. And you have mm -hmm. to have like a metric. For us, our metric was when we started out, we had to go someplace and for $500 sign up a new store, mm -hmm. right? So like I could drive, out, we're, in, we're like 13 miles outside of Detroit. So I could drive into Detroit, sign up, and if I got a new store, that cost me like 50 bucks, you know? So that was way ahead of 500. But flying to San Diego, if I fly to San Diego and I don't sign up six stores, then, you know, my three grand, I'm, I'm, I'm backwards on the budget. So, uh, but if you can do a trade show for five grand and sign up, you know, 10, 12, 15 stores, you're in good shape. Exactly. Yeah, so that, was, that was kind of the number we put at it. I, it was just, you know, was it 500, 550, 450? I don't know, but 500 seemed like a good number, Jerry. So Makes we just sense. like put that number to it and then, you know, and then it, it's kind of a game. You play that game while you're, while you're with yourself. If you have a great day, you know, three day trade show and you sign up eight, you know, stores in that day. Well, then you go to Red Lobster <laughs> you sign up eight stores in that day. Well, then you go to In-N-Out Burger, you know, 
Yeah. Like you just kind of play the game. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm learning something very important from you, Tom, which is that just start thinking about budgeting. Start thinking about that early. Think about the numbers early. Um, I'm definitely not really like that when I yeah. first started on YouTube. And I yeah. think I've gotten better at that. But, you know, when I started making YouTube content, I was fully employed, right? So, like, yeah. I didn't have to worry about the budgeting stuff as much. But I think right. Right. part of me, I'm almost playing catch up. And that's something so good talking to you, learning about this. It's like set a budget, man. You have to set a budget. Even if it just – all it does is it anchors you. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah, I think any business plan – I used to teach a class, and, and, and uh, every once in a while I'll go speak at college about business planning. and. And there's all these categories and you have to be good at all of them. A good entrepreneur is like a generalist. So, you know, your finance side is part of it and your marketing side and your product side and your customer side. Um, those are all pieces. And I think sometimes the way to one piece to communicate with the other is like just in a dollar figure, you know, some in a budget. Like the marketing guy can say, well, how much are we going to spend? And the finance part of the business says, you get $500 for every new store you, you sign up. And then the marketing guy go, great, I can run with that. Like our marketing team, you know, it's not a very big team, it's just a couple of us. Like we can say, all right, good. We know if we're doing well or we know if we're doing bad. But you can't just send people to a trade show and say, sell as much as you can because they're going to stand there and say, is this good? Is this bad? You know, and I talk to, I talk to people at trade shows because there's downtime in the morning and the evening. And you talk to other, other booths and you say, like, how do you measure if this is a good trade show or not? And they'll say, oh, we don't know. You know, I'll say, well, if you don't know, how do you know if you had a good, you know, like, how do you know if you're doing it right? How do you know if last year was good and this year was good? So yeah. I like metrics. Exactly. I love it, man. Metrics. It's metrics are so important. And, you know, for me, I like to focus on certain metrics like YouTube wise, you know, yeah. what's your revenue, what's your subscriber growth and all that. But I think in a more general sense, when running a business, there's other metrics that I have to kind of start bringing into and it would be a good practice for me to kind of like do it. And I might like do some of that on my, one of my other channels. I kind of like show people how I'm learning from you. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, and then the good, like the executive part of the business is deciding what the metrics are, mm -hmm. right? Like if it was just subscriber count, right? You could go on Fiverr and get a thousand subscribers <laughs> tonight, right? But that's not just subscribe. That's not just the count you're doing. It has to be a combination of things, yeah. right? Does that yeah. make sense? Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. then what are you going to do to get those subscribers? And who are they too? Like if, if they're, you know, if you start, if you did a, show about Fortnite or something you might pick up a bunch of 13 year olds but it might not be what you're looking for yeah exactly so tom you did the bulletproof vest and then when did you start moving into other stuff you know we have one of your shields and stuff like that how did all of that come about yeah so um that comes about from you understand like who's our customer and what do they need and then you talk to them or you talk to the, your, your stores and you just go out there and you try to meet as many people as possible so, um, and like, what don't they need? So we would bring prototypes of a bunch of things to trade shows. And then the people that you like and trust, the dealers that sell a lot of product, you could say, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And um, like, for example, one of the first products we, the first product we invented other than our vest, our vest is, um, was, I don't really consider it an invention. It was really just like, we bought everybody else's bulletproof vest and we sort of said, okay, um, what can we do here? Like, and, and the answer was, you can do a lot, but you have to just make one vest. You can't make a bunch of different models. So, so our vest was kind of like, if you average every bulletproof vest on the market, you got ours. Like the size is pretty average, a little generous. The materials are pretty average. Um, and, then we, and it only comes in black because that's the most popular seller. But uh, the first product we did, which was an invention, was our bulletproof baseball cap. Oh, it's a cap that has a front third is covered with a panel. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason we did it is because a lot of our customers were armored car drivers. And uh, armored car guys can't wear a ballistic helmet into a bank. If they walked in with a ballistic helmet, the, uh, the customers would freak out and run, you know? Yeah. So we needed something very discreet they could wear that would sort of not be overtly bulletproof. So we invented this hat. Um, with a panel in the front and the first prototypes we showed to people and we said, what do you think? You know, how's it fit? How's the shape? 
you know, do you like it? What would you pay for it? That type of thing. Mm-hmm. And then when we found out people sort of liked it, then, uh, then we went forward with it. And then we just continue to do that. We've shown a bunch of products that people didn't like. And uh, we've shown a bunch of products that they have. So the ones that they do like, they go into production. And the ones they don't like, they don't. They stay in our conference room. Wow. That's and awesome. I, we've seen other companies introduce products that we showed to people and they didn't really like. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Like we did a bulletproof hoodie and people didn't really care for it. Our, cus- our customers didn't. They just didn't see it as professional looking. It looked kind of slop- sloppy, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is funny because I'm wearing one right now. Yeah. One whole hoodie right now but they just didn't look professional so our customers were like i I don't know who buys that but not anyone that's buying their stuff for work so not it's not you so like okay so we didn't do anything with it but there's a product out there now that's a bulletproof hoodie so i see it's interesting you mentioned that because it sounds like talking to you your clientele your um buyers are probably a lot more professional right then you know there's certain brands that cater more towards like casual people like you know people who let's say manufacture bulletproof hoodies or bulletproof you know cool sweater vests or something like that whereas like you probably cater you said like you know armored truck drivers maybe police officers and stuff like that yeah yeah uh, yeah our our um our product is definitely catering to people who don't want to die at work is what we usually say yeah. So there are uh, there are people that buy this product as part of their like work equipment. We when we did our market research, um, we looked at like what does it cost to go from unarmed security to armed security, because that can usually get you like a three or four dollar an hour raise, you know, when you go from unarmed to armed. And uh, but what does it cost you in money? You need to buy a vest. You need to buy a sidearm. You, you know, you need to get your pistol permit. So, and uh, we had to make that sort of affordable. We wanted to make it co- comparable to like a really good pair of work boots, a hard hat, some, you know, some cold weather clothing that you might have to buy if you got a job in construction. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I would say the majority of our customers are people who are buying this product for work. Mm-hmm. And I think mm, that's a kind of an interesting kind of brand positioning question too, because you know, you got this client base right now. Do you plan on maybe introducing a more casual line or something like that? Or do you think right now you're happy with what your, um, your like customers are? Yeah, we're really happy with our customer base. Mm -hmm. Um, we're trying to, um, each year we get more and more police departments, Mm -hmm. um, as part of our base, like they're just deciding that they don't, maybe they don't really need to spend all the money for the high end stuff. And they can just outfit their guys, you know, with a with a quality product that's that's not as custom bit, custom built. Mm-hmm. And we're getting a lot of like small town police departments where the big companies don't send sales reps out into, you know, what you'd consider more like rural areas. So they just need a few vests at a time and they just need a large and an extra large, that type of thing. So we're happy to pick up those people. Um, and then we just see an expansion into this um you know, the armored car and the armed security and all of these sort of companies. I, I should also mention that it's a lot easier to, um, to make money when you can sell like 15 vests to an organization than it is one vest at a time. So yeah. I think we'll stay with that. Um, and then there's other brands in the business. And some of those brands uh, do a better job of like catering to like the militia clientele. Like that's a, you know, the, the, you know, like they're the weekend warriors, you know, like they buy this stuff to wear it while they're shooting three gun events and they're, you know, they're out in the woods or they're hunters and that type of stuff. And, and that's a good market, but there's companies that already kind of cater to that. And um, it's not so authentic to me. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not a weekend warrior, so I don't really jump in and they're not going to say, oh, Tom is our hero. You know, like he, he I want to be like him. I'm just like a professional guy trying to save lives. So, yeah. and I think I relate better with like the EMTs and the armored car guys and that we're, mm-hmm. we're trying to do our job the best we can. And, exactly. And, yeah. exactly. Um, Tom, when you started building your team to run your company and stuff, what were some of the criteria you looked at to, to find the right fit? Yeah. As well, first I had to look at what I was good at and what I was terrible at. Mm-hmm. And I am terrible at a few, a, a bunch of things, I think. So uh, the first thing I really needed to do was I needed to get my personal hands away from any of the um, day-to-day and precise stuff. I'm I'm especially terrible at packing orders. 
like I make mistakes. My mind wanders. I'm the sort of the semi-creative type that just starts thinking about other things. And before you know it, I screwed something up. So, um, so I had to find someone who had operations experience right away. So as a guy, Chris, that works here, he's our director of operations. And, uh, so, and then after you sort of fill in that big gap that you're not so good at, then it was, um, it was all good from there. Then you just figure out, you know, what the operations guy tells me, Hey, we need a top notch warehouse manager, you know? So, okay, let's get a top notch warehouse manager. So, yeah. So it, it goes from there. I think you make up and then those three folks and, um, I have good advisors. I was part of a group called entrepreneurs organization where we all work to be each other's advisors, like a board of directors, kind of like, it's almost like I sit on your board and you sit on my board and then we meet once a month to see what fires we can help each other put out. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like I think for entrepreneurs having like a mastermind group or something is so important, yeah. man. I really think so. Your friends aren't going to get it. You know, when you're off on your own, there's a lot of uh, stress and risk and the people that leave that stuff behind at 5 PM when they leave work don't understand it. So yeah, I think you have to, um, you have to, organize with other entrepreneurs and not socialize. I'm not talking about, you know, cause socializing with entrepreneurs doesn't work because none of us have any social time. Mm -hmm. okay. You need to organize like a mastermind group or an EO group where you're forced to, to attend and, uh, and be there for each other. Yeah. Yeah. That I love that. Rough. That's another kind of actionable lesson we can learn from talking to Tom. It's like, it's not just about socializing, having a network, like you guys have to really commit to each other a little. And I really like that. Yeah, much better a smaller group that's committed to one another than uh, a networking thing. I, I, my business has had very, um, very little uh, input from any networking. Mm -hmm. Like I know a lot of people, you know, but, um, but very few people I know know anyone that needs to buy bulletproof vests. Mm -hmm. So. So that I think maybe I only made ever made one sale as a referral from a friend. Mm -hmm. It's all been, it's nice to make friends quickly at these trade shows and events and seminars and, and it, you know, these sort of industrial group things, but, uh, but that's not, those are professional relationships. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. My roommate, he's, he's in a writer group, right? So like every week they sit together and they will literally go over each other's scripts. It's yeah, like you have to commit. Good. So that's like my analogy. It's like the difference between just sitting around a coffee table and just like, oh, how you doing? You know what? Yeah. Which is like, no, we're actually helping each other with our scripts and stuff like that. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, um, you can tell if you're an entrepreneur, a group is, is uh, effective by asking how's business. And if your group is not effective and you ask how's business, everyone will say, oh, it's good, it's good, it's good. But if it's an effective group, they'll say, well, we're suffering in the southeastern United States, but we're we're having some success in the Northwest, you know, or they give you the good with the bad or just the bad, mm -hmm. then you're in an effective group. But if yeah. they're, um, uh, you know, going like skimming the facts, then you don't need to hang out with those folks. Yeah. There's nothing you are in there. You yeah. might as well find your friends. Like you have true friends maybe that you grew up with or that you did other things, have other interests with. Those are, stick, stay with those friends for, and stay with those interests. But when you want professional networking, professional friends, get the ones that are going to be honest with you and, and committed to one another. Yeah. I because love that piece of advice. A bunch of noise. The <laughs> country club is full of noise. Yeah. Unless you like to play golf, that's an interest that you share with people. Yeah. But, uh, but if you join a country club thinking it's going to help your business, I mean, maybe if you have a product that all of those people will use, but for me, at running a bulletproof vest, there's nobody at the country club that needs my stuff. So yeah. I can skip it. I can <laughs> skip the dues and I don't have to play golf on Saturdays because I don't like golf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think a great lesson I'm learning from you is also like for me as a person, I, when I'm with like really truly entrepreneurial people will give me advice I need to open up to. Like I usually... I don't tell them, okay, I'm struggling reaching, let's say, audience members in South America or something. You know, I don't really say that. But I, sh I should take the initiative and like, be more specific about my entrepreneurial kind of challenges and um, you know, some of the good things that's happened too. Right? These are the people that are very successful, the people that put it on the line. Yeah. Now, you, I think a lot of people are afraid to say you know, things are going well, things are going poorly. 
Um, but if you don't say things going poorly, you'll never hear a, a solution. No, you, no one will ever help you come up with a solution. Yeah. And if you had the solution already, things wouldn't be going poorly. Exactly. So sometimes it's time to fess up. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, wow, Tom, this is amazing, man. Guys, fess up, man. That's a good lesson. Fess up and, you know, be selective yeah. how you fess up, right? If you're That's with your true, true friends, fess yeah. up about your feelings. But if you're with, like, advisors, people that can help you, like, grow your business, fess up about specifics. You're right. But if the people can't, if you have no confidence that they can help you, then you don't have to fess up. Yeah, no exactly. Problem, right. You know, and it's also doesn't hurt to ask for a referral, right? To say, look, I'm struggling with my tax situation or my uh, marketing situation. Do you know anyone that's good at this? And they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, my friend Bill's good at it. So, yeah. And then always buy lunch. Like, mm. just always, like, I, I hardly ever, if I do need help over the years and it was local, I, I, I always invited the person to lunch. I always tried to see them on their property. If you're asking a favor, go see them. Don't try to get them to see you go see them be punctual buy lunch and they'll 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 help you solve your problem yeah the, the most it'll be the most effective lunch purchase ever <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> so tom let's say someone wants to work for you what criteria are you looking for in like people let's say who apply to work for bullet safe oh uh, the, that's mm. a good question uh, the number one criteria is you have to live near our building <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> like people all the time say, "I want to work for you." I live in Arizona. Like, well, that really not going to work. It's going to be a hell of a commute, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and then you have to fill the need that we have. You know, as we build out our our group, you know, we have we decide what we need. Like right now, we need uh, another warehouse person. You know, assembler, someone to assemble vests. Basically, mm -hmm. they're not they're not stitching. They're just taking the pieces, parts, and putting it together in the right way. Mm -hmm. So it's not rocket science or anything. So we use, in this case, we're using Indeed, which is a job website. And they have like a competency exam people can take mm -hmm. that will ask some questions about assembling merchandise, mm -hmm. warehousing and assembly. So we're looking for people that score well on that test. It's pretty straightforward. Then we'll bring them in. Um, me personally, I don't hire people who aren't happy. If you're, um, if you talk about how your last job sucked, um, guess what? This job's going to suck too, because it's a <laughs> job, right? I look for people that are, um, that are just a happy go lucky type of people. Cause I can't make them happy. This a $2 an hour raise isn't going to help you. Um, you know, it's just not, there's nothing here that's going to make anyone happy. That's miserable. Yeah. So I look for people that are already kind of a happier person. I like to have a happy, um, you know, happy work environment. I just like people that, you know, can find the good in these things. So that's my personal criteria. Um, and that's really the only thing that I weigh that way down the law on is the person has to be a happy person. And then everybody else can, can help assess their, you know, effectiveness and their, you know, I don't know what else it could be, but their marketing skills or their, you know, sales, whether they're a good salesperson or whatever. Um, you know, that usually, you know, in advance, but usually at the interview process, I'm really just interviewing them to see if they're happy, you know, and if there's some really weird personality trait, we can deal with pretty, a lot of weird traits. We all have them. I mean, it's like family here, right? So everybody's a little strange, but, uh, but we're just weeding out, you know, people who are miserable, people who don't like other people, that type of thing. Um, yeah. So that's kind yeah. of it. But nothing here is super rocket science. I mean, this is not, um, you know, it's like we're just making and selling bulletproof vests. They're really not that sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just, but if you, it'd be nice if everybody could come in and have a decent work day without getting into arguments and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business owners have like a morning routine and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a morning routine or is every day different for you? I have a few things I ha I do to make myself work better. Mm -hmm. um, I make a post-it note list of everything that I need to do that day. So I come in, that's the first thing I do. Um, I come in, I sit down at my desk and I make a list. I look at, uh, you know, I just use Google Calendar for my calendar. Mm -hmm. I look at what's on there and then uh, what has to get done. What's left over from yesterday's list that I haven't accomplished yet. Yeah. Right. Um, 
And that usually is, um, then I just work all day to get the list done, you know? Usually the first thing on the list is email. Like before I check my email, and make the list. So the first thing on the list will be email. I read through, I go through every one of them. If I can answer it in 10 seconds, I do. Mm -hmm. But if I can't, I flag it like purple flag, like on the email program. I go through them all. Usually that takes me, there's a lot of email. It just takes me about 9.45. And then I go back and then I look at my list, make sure there's not anything super pressing. And I go into to the emails, all the flagged ones, and I do all those. And that usually, just doing that usually gets me all the way to like noon or one in the afternoon. And then if, I'm, if it's not too bad, um, then I can work on some of the other things I need to do. Like, uh, you want to know what's on today's list? Yeah, sure. Okay. Today's a Monday, so there's a lot of email on Monday because people mm. have been sending us email since Friday afternoon. Mm. So, so that's my explanation. So it literally took me till about 4.30 today until I finished all the emails. Wow. There, you know, a lot of them are placing orders, like they're dealers that have an order. There's people with a question. You know, there's people with issues. Mostly it's just, you know, stuff. There's a lot of dealer, dealer inquiries, like people want to become a dealer, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So today was, um, um, we are working on our affiliate program. So this is the big task for the week. Uh, affiliate program is um, people who have like blogs and websites and things like that can get a special link where they say shop at bulletsafe.com and that link tracks their sales. So you, uh, have you signed up? Yeah, there? I'm part of yeah. it. Yeah. So we have, um, you're probably part of it on a, on a, on a network called share a sale. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, there's another network that's like ShareSale called AvantLink. Mm. And AvantLink has a lot of like outdoors type people and gun people as their affiliates. So we are doing both. We're going to be doing both net networks. So I have to do all the stuff I did on ShareSale. I have to do on AvantLink. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, that's, I, so that's a big checklist over there. I, have to, mm -hmm. I do a lot of the technical stuff here. So I have to set up a data feed for Avant link and I have to send over some banner ads and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so that's that. Um, there's a couple other things uh, going on. Some people contacted us through Facebook and had questions, wow. you know, so I have to go over and Facebook and answer their, you know, usually their questions that are so easy to answer. It's so obvious, but, um, and then uh, we had a DHL shipment coming in that got held up for some reason. So I had to chase that down. And then um, for some reason, the security DVR in the building is beeping at us. So I have to figure out what the hell is going on with that. Yeah. So those just stuff. I mean, some of it is like, like honestly, the DVR thing is it's that's facilities management, but I'm the only one here that understands how it works or has a password to it. So mm -hmm. that's my task. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, some of it's BS and some of it's work, but yeah. everything, every bit of it needs to get done. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I'm glad that Tom is sharing this with all of us because I'm sure if I shared with Tom or the audience what I do every day, it's, it's a lot like this. A lot of it is not like the sexy stuff that people think like, oh, you know, he's like meeting with this. No, no, no. A lot of it's just like upkeep. A lot of it is really just upkeep. Yeah, a lot of like we have a very popular YouTube channel where we shoot things, right? Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of people think I spend a lot of time shooting things. <laughs> but the reality is it's like once a quarter – we work for a day and a half and I shoot like 12 videos yeah, yeah. and those get released over time. So it's not like I get to do that. I mean, there might be a new one every couple of weeks, but every couple of weeks I don't get to go shoot things. I are, I did that like in, you know, in March yeah. and now we're just going to want, you know, so yeah, it's, it's very mundane. It's very day to day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that people who want to work for themselves or, you know, want to be entrepreneurs have to realize very early in the process. It's like what's getting you through is the passion, but ultimately it is like doing work. But the difference is at least you feel like your worth is more meaningful, your work and your worth is more meaningful. But it really, it's not like your workload changes. In fact, it probably increases when you run your own business. It definitely does increase. There's no doubt about it. And the stress level goes way oh, up. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I it's um it's very different it's very um you're very exposed to everything yeah. when you run your own business the highs are higher but the lows are lower oh. i think of it as the difference between being indoors versus being outdoors like if your job that's indoors you're insulated from a lot of things and that's what a corporate job is like 
you stay indoors, you have your controlled environment, you do your controlled things, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's only so many things you can do indoors. Now, if you have an outdoor job, right? Things can change at the drop of a hat. There can be a clouds rolling through, lightning storm. It might be super cold, it might be super hot, but you get to see the sunrise and the sunset. You get to swim in the lakes, right? You get to climb the hills and see the great vistas. The difference is that one thing requires a bunch of preparation, right? You got to pay attention to the weather report. You have to dress appropriately. You have to plan all these things. And then you also have to do your job, right? Whereas the indoor job, you just show up and do your work. And that's, I think, the difference between working for someone else and being an entrepreneur is it just has that extra level of risk and exposure, but the highs are higher and the experiences are greater. So, yeah. Yeah. And in a literal way, you have more chances to see the sunrise and sunset too, because you can take right. breaks whenever you want. Right. Yeah. I would. Yeah. I don't know if the break taking is one of my strong suits. Mm -hmm. I don't, I basically sit in this office. I hammer it out. I got to tell you, Jerry, over the years, I've just learned to just pound it out. There's not, there's a uh, break taking is definitely not my strong suit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I don't even, um, I eat my lunch here usually. Wow. So yeah. It's, uh, yeah, break taking is not really my stuff. <laughs> yeah. I have learned to um, work fewer and fewer hours, um, but I'm still only down to about 45 a week. I see. Uh, there's DVR beeping. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I hear it. Yeah. I didn't get done today. Nice. <laughs> the nice. DVR is right here. Mm. This is the new DVR. Ah. Uh, that just didn't happen today, I guess. You don't get everything done every day. Exactly. Exactly. Oop, and there it's off. Yeah, I think it's going to stop. It beeps a few times and then it shuts up. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. In a way, it's that beep, I don't know it, why. it's a way for you to like remind yourself to take breaks too. Every time it beeps, okay, let's take a break. Yeah, do some push-ups or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, manager sits outside the door. He's got the same disease I do. We never take a break. So he'll yell push-ups and then we'll uh, <laughs> push up. Nice. Nice. Um, what is next for you guys? You know, 2020 is a crazy year, but what, what do you guys got planned? I know you guys have another affiliate program and of course more stores want to be dealers. What are some other things that are planned potentially? Yeah. Um, well, we're on version two of our best right now, which was um, a big upgrade from version one to version two. So we're taking feedback from a number of people. We're interviewing people about version three, mm. what that's going to look like, um, what changes we're going to make, how we're going to improve it and still keep it. We, we're very, we're very committed to our two hundred ninety nine dollar price. We mm -hmm. have a lot of research from our customers that says that's as high as they can go. So we have to, um, we have to search for some solutions there. Yeah. Uh, we uh, continue to bring more and more of the assembly into the United States mm. from overseas, um, and we continue to expand our operation. Like uh, we're growing and growing. So uh, those are the things. Um, do we have any new products coming out? Uh, nothing really super exciting. Nothing super exciting. Um, yeah, no, not, nothing that like the vests are probably 80, 85% of our business. Mm -hmm. So, um, everything after that is really an accessory product. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're doing a few new trade shows this year. So we're going to meet some new people and get into some new areas. Um, so that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Uh, but a lot of the trade shows have been canceled. Mm. So that's interesting. Yeah. So we had situations where we were planning to meet people and then they got canceled. So we had to go back and hit the phones and we sent out a postcard campaign that was very successful actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the civil unrest thing is kind of good for business, which is kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> We launched a we launched a line of riot gear three years ago. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know that. Mm, I didn't know that. Riot gear called Riot Ready. Okay. We launched it three years ago, and to be perfectly honest, she was kind of a dud. Mm. Like nobody was buying that much riot gear, and so we had a website for it. It was it had its own website, and you know it wasn't selling enough on its own to have it have its own website. So we just killed the website and just put it as a product category on the BulletSafe.com website, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the last month or so we sold more riot gear than we sold in the three years that we've had the brand. Wow. So, but we don't have it. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to get it all made, you know, but the people who ordered it 
didn't mind the, you know, we, we generally tell them like, okay, you can order it now, but it won't be ready till, you know, two months from now. Yeah. Said, well, yeah, that's less than anybody else. So there you go. So exactly. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So I guess I'm back in the riot gear business. I yeah. thought I was out of it, but I guess I'm back in it. Yeah, exactly. It's um, uh, the word I always use for 2020 is the, it's the year of pivots, right? So we just have to pivot wherever we're supposed to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's a good description of this year. It has been a strange one, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. So for viewers, all the stuff we talked about, I will have affiliate links so you guys can click on it and yeah, go click, directly to the page. Click Jerry's link. Don't click. Don't go to me. Click Jerry's <laughs> link. Yeah. And then you place an order with the same browser, but anytime within 60 days, our friend Jerry here will get credit for it. That's mm -hmm. how an affiliate program works. That's right. Pretty That's good. True. It works really well, actually. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to help the affiliates because we want people to, you know, create content. There's just not enough people out there doing, you know. Yeah. Blah. Yeah. I mean, I, one of the reasons I contacted Tom to everyone watching is just because, you know, I, I messaged Tom. I was like, dude, our state, you know, it's got a lot of restrictions with firearms. And I, I personally, you know, I'm pretty shy about that. So, but I want protection. Right. And that's why I was like, I know, especially um, like if you go more towards like east of LA, there, there's a county called San Gabriel Valley. It's basically like 60 to 80 percent Asian Americans, and those people have very, very high purchasing power. And I, I just know, like, there's, and we can talk about this later, but I know there's like people there that might not be comfortable purchasing firearms, but maybe they want armor too. So, like, right. there's, there's a lot of like people who have these questions and these wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of like business owners that carry a bunch of cash a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, any cash business that exists has two choices at the end of the day. They can hire an armored car service to come by and take the money, but that costs a good amount of money. So yeah. most small businesses don't do it. Yeah. Like my dad owned a liquor store, and every day he would have to take a bunch of money to the bank. Yeah. You know, I mean, that gets nerve-wracking if you're in a bad neighborhood <laughs> or, or if you – it's just gets nerve wracking. Even yeah. if you're in a good neighborhood, yeah. if you're doing it every day, you're carrying ten, twenty thousand dollars. You're an easy target. Yeah. So I think a lot of those folks over the years have gotten their concealed carry permit, mm -hmm. but that doesn't help you. I mean, what are you going to do? Kill a guy? Mm -hmm. You know. So I think uh, body armor has been kind of what uh, uh, it helps those folks sleep at night. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So um, for viewers. Um, this is probably going to go off my commentary breakdowns and Jerry Learns Business, but thank you guys for watching. Um, go follow Tom's company too. I'll link their social media too. So um, we'll definitely bring Tom back, man. Tom, um, this was a great interview. One thing you're really good at is interviewing. So this is, you're natural at this, and I don't know if you had practice or just a natural, but it was really great talking to you. Thank you. And great. we'll bring Tom back. If you guys have any questions or something, feel free to leave your questions and stuff down below. Yeah, I can answer them next time if you have me back. Yeah, definitely. It will be 100% my pleasure. Thanks, Jerry. Bye, guys. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye.